welcome to Environmental Experts Channel Islands Restoration Monthly Webinar Series. We started this in, I guess I want to say 2020. I don't remember exactly. We'd have to look on the webpage. Um, but it's been very popular. We've got a lot of interesting topics uh, that we've covered over the last year. Well, you know, we're working on two years now. And um, tonight we're going to hear about conservation and kayaking on the Channel Islands restoration and see some really cool pictures. So um, just a brief introduction about Channel Islands restoration. If you don't know about us, and I think most of you do, but it always bears repeating, uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, we're a habitat restoration contractor, and we do environmental consulting, and we do environmental education. My name is Ken Owen. I'm executive director of Channel Islands Restoration, and uh, we have Maury Spellman helping uh, today, who is our marketing director and volunteer coordinator and all around wears a lot of hats kind of guy. So as I said, we've uh, had quite a few uh, webinars. Last uh, month, we uh, got a really interesting update on the Island Fox, um, but there's just tons and tons to see on, uh, the, on our webpage. So go and check it out. Really great material on cirweb.org slash webinars. We're also live on Facebook and YouTube. And so all of these webinars are also um, archived there. In fact, they're archived automatically. Uh, the ones on this website are um, put up there usually a few days later. Uh, but if you want to see them right away, go right to our Facebook page, Channel Islands Restoration, or uh, YouTube, and you'll see, see us live there right now and be able to see a recording of it later on. So uh, as always, I like to remind people that uh, CIR, as I said a moment ago, is a nonprofit organization. Um, we don't have any grant funding or anything like that to do this particular webinar series, but it's part of our mission is to get the word out on all kinds of conservation issues and just issues in general that's uh, um, uh, things of interest to the conservation community and the island community. Uh, so um, remember us as we get closer to the end of the year, we'll be doing our year end campaign and we can always use your support. Another thing that I want to announce and you're hearing this for the first time tonight is we're going to have another autumn equinox cruise to Santa Rosa Island. Um, Maury will be posting a link to that in the chat in a little while. And uh, that is a day trip, uh, educational trip, where we have lots of really interesting folks like Steve Junak, who's an expert on the botany of the islands, and folks who uh, know the, the hikes really well, take you down to the Torrey Pines if you're a fast hiker and can get down there and back in time to catch the boat. But there's also simpler uh, hikes right around the ranch or intermediate ones up Cherry Canyon, lots of options for people of different uh, skill levels. Great way to see Santa Rosa Island uh, with a bunch of uh, enthusiasts, people who really are into the islands, all of us who have been working out there for now 20 years, be glad to take you out there with us. So that'll fill up pretty quick, but it's gonna be uh, live on our website pretty soon. And Maury has promised to put a link in the uh, chat today. So um, everybody's muted, by the way. Um, we don't take live questions, but there is a Q&A section, and I can see that people have already got a couple of questions in there right now. And I will be um, uh, gathering up the questions ahead of time so that we don't duplicate them. Uh, but feel free to type something right in the, the Q&A and we will um, ask those at the end of the uh, webinar. So uh, feel free to get them in early. It's a little bit easier that way than having them all come at the end, but that's how it usually works. Either way, feel free to ask your question. All right. So let me uh, introduce Chuck Graham. He's a freelance writer and photographer based in Carpinteria, California. 
He's been a beach lifeguard for 30 years, and he's led kayak tours at Channel Islands National Park for 20 years. Uh, his work uh, as a writer has been published in BBC uh, Wildlife Magazine, National Geographic Kids, National Geographic Books. It all says it right there. I'm just reading what you're seeing. <laughs> Canoe and Kayak Men's Journal, Outdoor Photography, Natural History, American Forest. Ah, wow. High Country News and West Wings. It's quite a list. He pens the column uh, Unpredictable Wilderness in the Coastal View, the, the publication, News in Carpinteria. His award-winning book, Carrizo Plain, Where the Mountains Meet the Grasslands, was released in January of 2021. There's a picture of the cover. You can reach Chuck on uh, Instagram at the Chuck Graham photo and also uh, on his website, chuckgrahamphoto.com. So uh, without any further ado, I'll stop the share here and let you go ahead and uh, let me make sure that you're able to do this. There you go, Chuck. You should be able to share your screen now. Yeah, see your, your slide. There you go. All right. All right, Ken, thank you very much for that. Very kind intro. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you, everybody, for uh, tuning in for this uh, Zoom presentation with uh, Channel Islands Restoration. Um, so um, the islands are uh, very special to me. Um, I'm sure like they are to so many others. Um, but a long time ago, I was wanted to immerse myself in the islands, and I always felt the best way to do that was uh, to kayak, to paddle around the islands. And I say it, you know, now I've said it for almost 30 years, I think kayaking is the best way to experience the islands. There's just so many places you can't get to on foot and um, paddling uh, offers you a lot of uh, different experiences you wouldn't get just by being on the island. I'm not saying that Hiking isn't a great way, it is, um, but uh, you definitely uh, enhance your experience uh, by being in a kayak. There's just so many places, so many nooks and crannies, there's places you can't get to in a boat. Uh, a kayak really offers you uh, so much more. So uh, this first photo, it is not the islands. This is this is my home beach. This is uh, the Carpinteria City Beach, it's actually that's the Carpenter County Beach um, behind me. That's the shot I took of myself. Um, and then my lifeguard tower is just down the beach to the east, uh, less than a quarter of a mile. So uh, I've lived and worked on that beach since 1975. So uh, this shot uh, kind of represents uh, my passion for the islands. And I've always just wanted to walk down the street from where I live and get my kayak out of the boathouse and then paddle across the channel. So I've done lots of channel crossings, but this is actually the first time I ever literally walked out the door with all my gear and then prep down there at the edge of the water and then paddle across the channel. So this shot was uh, right before the pandemic. This is uh, actually December 2019. And uh, I have to say that uh, Paddling to the islands is definitely a little bit more stressful than coming back. Uh, just minding the fog, the wind, hoping everything is uh, accurate on those weather reports. And then uh, pretty much uh, a real strong, steady pace, uh, at least through the shipping lanes from the beach there. So that's a long haul, but uh, it's definitely a, a, a relief once the shipping lanes are behind me. So this is uh, this is uh, after that first shot. This is uh, several months after. I, I want to say May 2020. So it was right uh, in the heart of the pandemic. And uh, as a guide for Santa Barbara Venture Company, we were uh, and the pier being built at Scorpion. We had to move over to Prisoner. So I left my boat uh, 
at prisoners and then went, went to work for a couple of days. But then um, the pandemic hit and there wasn't any access to the islands. But I eventually got a ride from a lobster fisherman friend of mine and uh, he dropped me off at prisoners and I ended up having a nice five day run in May uh, around uh, part of Santa Cruz, all of Santa Rosa, and then out to San Miguel. So this is a shot actually on the way down from that trip. This is uh, getting into the uh, potato patch, heading towards uh, West Santa Cruz Island there. You can see uh, Fraser Point's off to the right, and I'm hitting the west end there of the island. Uh, there's a lot of beautiful spots out there. Boy. So many, um, it's hard to put together a slideshow like this. There's just so many uh, pictures running through my head and then finding them all. And uh, But this is uh, just east of Cueva Valdez. There's some amazing caves and arches and this is a keyhole arch. You can't actually paddle through it, but uh, it makes for some nice compositions out there on the water. And there's a lot of wind out there, as a lot of people know. Uh, this is a day where trips got canceled and I decided to do a hike from uh, Scorpion Anchorage over to uh, Smugglers and then the creek below Yellow Banks and then up Montano and Ridge. So you can see all the white caps out there and you can see some definition there in the west, uh, west Santa Kappa Island. Uh, as a buddy of mine, good buddy of mine, Craig Fernandez. This is a long time ago, actually. This is uh, right inside uh, Diablo Anchorage on the north side of Santa Cruz. So there's a couple of big um, spires out there, rock outcroppings. Uh, and this is between one of those and the island. So you can see it's a popular place for seabirds. Lots of bird guano there. Uh, Santa Barbara Island. Boy, I haven't been out there in a while. Uh, <laughs> Need some help with the landing cove. Low on the priority list after uh, the pier being built at Scorpion and now the landing cove being rebuilt at Anacapa. So hopefully after that, uh, things will take place at Santa Barbara Island. This is on the south side of the island and there's an amazing blowhole over there. This is shot from my kayak. But the sea line is kind of like using it like kids do with a fire hydrant on a street in New York City. This is not springtime. Uh, this is actually uh, October uh, at Harris Point or overlooking Harris Point on San Miguel Island, but you can see that the buckwheat blooming there. And that's because uh, we get a lot of fog out at the islands and fog drip is the largest water input um, out on the islands, it's not rain. Uh, so sometimes you get a second and third bloom with uh, some of these hardy um, island wildflowers. You know, wildflowers. This is during the spring, and uh, this is overlooking Scorpion Rock, and that's an important uh, seabird site that's been restored over the years, and uh, it's been a great success story for conservation out of the islands. Uh, managed, you know, easily convinced a few other fellow kayak guides to get in the picture to offer some perspective, but then the uh, California brown pelicans flew in, and that just kind of added to uh, this image with all the seaside daisy in the foreground there. So, uh, love seeing whales, love seeing dolphins uh, while paddling across the channel, but I'm always on the lookout for seabirds. And uh, one of the birds that has come back to Scorpion Rock, that previous image, um, is the Cassin's Auklet. And I want to say there's somewhere between 30 and 40 nests out there now, but uh, prior to 2008, there weren't hardly any just due to crystalline ice plant kind of choking out everything, all the native vegetation and not allowing seabirds to nest out there anymore. So uh, the seabird crews out there, they've done an amazing job. Dave Mazurkiewicz at the park and uh, his crew, um, Jim, Howard, and uh, Katie, and the rest of the crew, they've done an amazing job of uh, bringing that back to life out there. And um, Cassin's Oclets, Scripps Merlets, Ashy Storm Petrels, uh, Pigeon Guillemots, 
Blagic and Brant's Cormont's Western Gulls, Black Oyster Catchers, they all enjoy nesting out there now. And there's uh, pelicans love roosting out there. They haven't nested out there in a long time. So hopefully maybe they'll add to um, this nesting sites out there. See what happens. Um, that's a baby, um, a chick, a Cassin's Auckland chick. And uh, the seabird crews, they, even though uh, they've, they've torn out all the crystalline ice pond that was choking out the uh, the, the rock, um, they still do maintenance and and uh, work with the birds that are out there nesting. And uh, so they're out there quite a bit during the summer checking nests and banding birds and keeping track of uh, all the inhabitants. That's also on scorpion rock. Uh, sometimes scorpion rock in the evening and certain times during the summer looks like a, uh, it reminds me of a concert at the County Bowl outside uh, on the rock, lots of lights flashing around. Uh, there's actually music out there, songbird music. Uh, so they set up kind of what looks like a glorified badminton net and uh, turn on the, uh, on the tunes, the uh, Ashy Storm Petrol tunes to attract the birds and then they, uh, catch birds in the net and they delicately uh, untangle them and then they ban them and, and give them a checkup and uh, sex them and all that and then they let them go. So this is a ashy storm petrel in the middle of the night. And these are uh, a diurnal bird, uh, the pigeon guillemot, and they also nest out there at uh, Scorpion Rock and uh, when they're around the islands, we see them every day. Uh, there's no denying their, their trills, their shrills, the calls they make uh, while they're on the water and inside the caves and the cliffs. Um, but I always love seeing these guys. Okay, we're uh, doing a little island hopping here. This is uh, San Miguel Island, uh, May 2020 during the pandemic. And uh, I, I was aware of common MERS uh, returning to uh, Prince Island. That's their most southerly nesting site uh, in California. Um, I never got any shots of them out there. And so um, that was one of my priorities was getting out there. And, and they, there was no uh, human intervention there. They just came back on their own after about a hundred year absence. So um, this is uh, Kyler Harbor. Uh, and uh, you can see the elephant seals. There was quite a few elephant seals uh, at Kyler Harbor uh, during that spring. Um, and this is me just going up to the campground to up Night River Canyon, set my tent, and, uh, and then do a, a little photography out there. This is Dawn at Kyler Harbor. Uh, that's Prince Island out there in the, in the background. Uh, that's a good buddy of mine, Danny Trudeau. Uh, he's done a lot of paddling trips with me out there and my other excursions up and down the California coast. And these are the MERS and um, I had no idea where they were on Prince Island. Um, so I paddled around Prince Island and uh, of course they were in the most difficult part of the island to get to, to get these photos. This is not an easy photo to get to. I had to work quick. Uh, there was a lot of Northwest swell in the water and they were perched on these two giant columns um, connected to Prince Island. Uh, so there was a lot of water moving around and uh, a little bit of a risk factor with the camera gear, but uh, I did manage to get uh, some stuff that I liked. And uh, last few years, I've had the privilege of being a volunteer ranger out on San Miguel Island. And uh, I always look for it when I go out there my girlfriend, Holly, um, I always look for a, a good window to paddle around the island. It's you know, kind of a iffy thing out there just because there's so much uh, weather out there, fog and wind and everything, you just never know. Um, but I have managed to do it three times now. And uh, that's actually Castle Rock in the background. I'm actually working my way through all the reef passages uh, around Point Bennett. but. There's just something about Castle Rock that's kind of uh, a little intimidating, a little spooky, but also really amazing to see. 
And that's a good shot. Gives you a good perspective of what Point Bennett looks like uh, out on San Miguel. This is the world's largest congregation of seals and sea lions. And uh, it's six different species that utilize uh, Point Bennett for breeding and pupping and just hauling out. Um, but what an amazing place uh, right there in the California current. Lots of life there, lots of smells, lots of sounds, lots of drama. But uh, a great example of recovery of uh, marine mammals there at Point Bennett. Uh, like I said, um, I always look for a good window to paddle around San Miguel. And uh, typically, uh, we like to get out there in September and October. Uh, the northern fur seals in the California sea lions, the pups are born in June. So there's not a lot of movement from them then. Uh, but by September, September, October, they are super active, super curious, really playful, um, like kids on the beach, uh, just body whopping and getting swept up a berm there. You can see in the background and then just running back out there and uh, body surfing again. Um, so it's very likely that uh, these animals are now three, four months old. They've never seen a kayaker before. So their curiosity is overwhelming they just can't help themselves and come up to the boat so these are all north and first seals and they're all kind of resting on the water and then they do love coming over to the boat this is actually a, uh, a north and first seal pup on the left and a sea lion giving it a smooch on the right so there is uh, a lot of kumbaya moments out there with them on the beach and in the water and there's a real young northern fur seal pup um, tail. It's doing a little thermal regulating there with its tail, uh, but it, uh, it's the eye and the and the fore flipper over its snout that really makes it for me. Another northern fur seal pup. These are all pups. And that's my kayak. Uh, that was. Also, that's also during the pandemic. This is basically paddled uh, from prisoners to East Point in a day. Um, kind of have a, a rule when I paddle out there and I'm on the end of an island. Uh, if it looks good, you just keep going because you just you never know what it's going to look like the next day. So um, I knew the weather, it looked like the weather was going to be good. And I felt good enough, so I just uh, went for it. Uh, but there's lots of beautiful little pocket beaches um, between uh, Skunk Point and East Point. Um, so it's really just amazing out there being by yourself and uh, experiencing it that way. These are two tent mates. Um, I had a night a while back, a long while back, out at um, Playa Vieja which is a great cove to camp at. Um, and uh, there was nothing there on the beach when I got there. And when I pitched my tent, uh, I was resting in my tent in the middle of the night. And I uh, immediately noticed I couldn't roll over uh, to either side. I, I was actually pinned by three uh, young elephant seals. This is two of them. Uh, I had two on my right and one on my left. And um, they were, snuggling up to me and amazingly enough the tent poles didn't collapse or snap that day they did the next day um, but uh, once I realized what was going on and and they were fine with me and I was fine with them we all slept soundly and then in the morning they moved away these two were in the front of the tent but I, I could then stretch and lift my arms out and and uh, everything was back to normal but uh, very sweet uh, as you can see, the, the faces are adorable. That's a shot, uh, a, a self-portrait I took through my tent, uh, looking out towards East Point. And that's uh, during a circumnavigation of Santa Rosa and San Miguel Islands. Uh, once again, that's my friend Danny Trudeau in the foreground, and then my out further is Craig Fernandez. This is paddling back down 
uh, from San Miguel. Now we're on the north side, the front side of Santa Rosa Island. And those are some California sea lions doing a little thermal regulating, a little rafting out there. Uh, just beyond Carrington Point, that's the west end of Santa Cruz out there. Um, and I took that shot, I want to say, May 2020. And as many people know, the sea caves out of the Channel Islands, especially Anacapa and Santa Cruz Islands, are honeycombed with lots of sea caves. And um, sometimes you get some amazing light in some of these caves, a lot of light reflecting off the bottom and hitting the ceiling. I didn't, there's no artificial light here. This is all natural light. It looks like an indoor swimming pool. This is on the north side of Santa Cruz Island. This is a shot overlooking uh, Scorpion Rock uh, during the spring. Coreopsis are one of the first wildflowers that bloom uh, out there on the islands. And uh, I want to say I took this in February. I don't know what year. Uh, but uh, you can see Anacapa Island out there the, on the sunrise. And this is A-03. This is a, you know, bald eagle that's made scorpion anchorage in his own the last uh, almost a couple of years, I estimate now. Um, so we started guiding tours again there in February 2021 at Scorpion, and uh, we started seeing this this uh, male bald eagle, and he's now about six years old. Um, I thought when we first were seeing him that he was going to you know, get disturbed and then move on to somewhere else, but he stuck around and um, Biologists tell me they're, the bald eagles are not really concerned with people when they're down below them. It's when they're up above them that they get a little spooked. So I've had to uh, be careful taking pictures from the cliffs, but uh, he's become accustomed to seeing us a lot on the water. And uh, it's been amazing seeing him almost every day. I want to say we see him maybe 75 to 80% of the time uh, during trips. Uh, in the scorpion area. And he's a fine example of the natural balance being returned to the islands. Um, I want to say from maybe 1952 to 2002, we had no bald eagles out there at all. Um, but Park Service and Nature Conservancy, the Institute for Wildlife Studies, they did an amazing job bringing everything back to the natural balance out there when it comes to bald eagles and ridding non native. Um, ranch animals from the islands and trapping and releasing golden eagles and captive breeding island foxes and bald eagles, a keystone species, a, a really important species out there. So it's been amazing seeing them every day, the behavior. And uh, when we first got there, uh, we were seeing them with uh, a couple of juvenile bald eagles. Um, but of late, uh, the last several months, we've been seeing them with uh, a female, a bigger bird. Um, females are about 25% bigger than the males. And we've been seeing them hanging out on the cliffs together, uh, spending time. So hopefully around the corner here during winter and hopefully in the spring, they'll have a nest out there. We're we'll keeping our eyes open. But uh, this bird was born out on the, the west end of Santa Cruz, out of Fraser Point. And I want to say if you go to the Park Service website, they have the Eagle Cam. You can actually see the nest where this bird was born. His mother's name is Cruz. I want to say she had a couple more eaglets uh, that fledged uh, out of that nest. So uh, he moved down here all the way down to Scorpion. And uh, I want to say Biles have told me, uh, particularly Dr. Peter Sharp told me they have never had a nest um, in Scorpion. So this would be really amazing to have a nest in that area. The next closest nest is at Yellow Banks around that area. And then the, there's another one. Um, uh, the canyon of Pelican Bay, and that nest, uh, the pair there, have been together for 16 years. All legal and monogamous, so if they survive, they come back to the same nest year after year. So uh, there's about 50 bald eagles now uh, out across the chain from Manacapa and all the way to San Miguel. Um, there's about 12 nesting pairs and another 24, 25 individuals. 
That's O3 again on the right with uh, its potential mate. And you can see she's a little bit bigger. And these shots I took from the kayak. That's O3. Uh, one of the more entertaining uh, moments out there with O3 and, and uh, other bald eagles that have been seen around there the last couple of years is they love antagonizing the gulls. Um, I haven't seen one eating a gull. I'm pretty sure they could kill one, take one if they wanted to. I've seen O3 with uh, common mirrors and uh, some other unidentified birds. Uh, I've seen them with a lot of fish. I saw them with a fish the other day. Um, but uh, probably buzzes scorpion rock, I would say somewhere between five and 10 times a day and just to antagonize them. So once he flies over the rock, literally every gull that can fly comes off the rock and chases them until they get tired of it. Um, but one day I saw O3 do just that, buzz the rock. Um, lots of gulls flying after him and he caught a fish on the fly and then looked like he knew what he was doing and flipped the fish back behind him to throw all the gulls off and then grabbed another fish and then took it to the cliff. So it didn't look like it was his first rodeo. Um, but an amazing factoid about them is the Channel Islands is a very unique national park. Half of it's underwater and there's a one mile boundary around each island. The bald eagles can see a fish a mile away. So I'm always amazed by that. And another bird that's recovered well out of the islands, the peregrine falcon. Um, I want to say we have about 17 nesting pairs on Santa Cruz alone now. And, and uh, once again, if you go to the park website, there's a peregrine falcon camp um, on the east end of the island there in Anna County. Um, this is also shot from a kayak while I was leading a tour. And I noticed this peregrine coming way off the water with this male common loon. And the loon was about as big as the falcon. And the peregrine was working hard, laboring to almost dragging the bird off the water to the cliff. So it was pretty tuckered out by the time it got to the cliff and the loon was struggling and the peregrine kept subduing it. But the peregrine was also resting um, because it was, it was tired. And so that allowed me to get pretty close and watch it uh, tame this loon before it flew off to its nest. Here's one of the most amazing birds in the world, uh, the island scrub jay. They have the uh, smallest range of any bird in North America. I want to say it's like 500 species or something, close to that. Um, but these guys are uh, known as the eco engineers of Santa Cruz Island. This is the only place in the world you can see them. And um, biologists from the Smithsonian have told me that uh, these birds are directly responsible for recovery of island oak groves on Santa Cruz Island. So they uh, love acorns um, and they cache, an adult island scrub jay can cache about 3,500 to 6,500 acorns a year. Uh, and they innately know to plant the acorn point down so it can germinate. And they also plant them up slope. So with all that fog drip that keeps the island Moist at times, it, it uh, allows those those uh, new island oaks to catch that moisture and, and work itself into the groundwater and into the creeks. There's lots of freshwater creeks out there down to the ocean, so they're a very important bird. Um, the biologists out there that monitor the island scrub jays are also keeping track of the potential of West Nile hitting the islands. Um, I've been told it's not a question of if, but when, and then that would maybe change things dramatically, um, especially for the J. So uh, they do a lot of monitoring a couple of times a year. Um, the Island Scrub J, other things that are really amazing about it is it's a third size larger than its cousin, the Western Scrub J, and a deeper blue and a bigger bill. And there's also a little bit of Darwinism out there going on as we speak. Um, there's the Jays that love the acorns with this straighter beak. There's also the jays that prefer the pine nuts, which 
has allowed them to evolve with a curved beak. Uh, so there's a little bit of that going on out there. And uh, I'm just also monitoring that. So this is a very recent, um, and it happened within a week. Uh, this is actually in the corral where we keep our gear for leading kayak trips at Scorpion in Scorpion Canyon. This is uh, another Jay and uh, uh, the, the maintenance guys cleaned up the corral on the right side and it, it exposed uh, a couple of southern alligator lizards. And um, usually you see the Jays drop down and grab maybe an insect, a cricket or something and then pop right back up. But I noticed that this jay dove down and then stayed down for a few seconds. And then when I grabbed my camera, it flipped this uh, alligator lizard out in the open and uh, ripped its tail off and then uh, grabbed it and took it to its nest, which was really close by. I saw it do this twice to two alligator lizards within a week. It's not just the acorns. And I don't think I could talk about the Channel Islands National Park without talking about showing images of uh, another uh, success story was captive breeding of island foxes when they were almost extinct out on uh, the three islands in the park that have populations of foxes, Santa Cruz, Santa Rosa, and San Miguel Islands. Um, I spent a lot of time with them. I think everybody knows me knows. Um, I'm always looking for some behavior and uh, antics uh, with island foxes. They're great tree climbers. Uh, all the foxes have their own personalities. And this this was a, a fox at Prisoner's Harbor that I wasn't sure was going to make it. He was the runt of the litter. And I saw him struggling early on, and I didn't think he was going to make it. He couldn't keep up with his mother and his sibling. Um, but as time went on, and, and as we were spending a lot of days out there leading trips with prisoners. Um, I came upon this fox uh, hanging my wetsuit in a tree. And when I was grabbing my wetsuit, he ripped up the tree and was playing with my hand as I was running it back and forth on the branch. And then I was seeing him on trail runs uh, just up above at the, uh, the uh, lookout. That's that little shack up there above uh, overlooking Prisoner's Harbor, and he would jump out of the trail in front of me while I was running, and then he'd rip past me. And so one day, I, I obviously couldn't keep up with him, but um, I ran after him, and, and he was playing over at the kayaks, and uh, it was getting dark, and so I was going back to the tent, and he, he just wanted to keep playing. He was just running at me and forcing around, and uh, Got in the tent, went to sleep. And then the next morning, he was at my tent. And he, I don't know if he brought me the mouse, but he brought a mouse. And he dropped it uh, at my tent. I actually had the tent inside the old cattle chute. And when uh, I reached for my camera, and then he grabbed the mouse and went back to the kayak. So he started flinging this mouse around. And, uh, and then he just kind of along like that for a while out there until we uh, moved back to Scorpion. Like I said, they're amazing tree climbers and uh, island foxes at uh, Scorpion Canyon, I would say they're maybe a little spoiled. Uh, we got we have it good down there with uh, the old fig trees. Uh, these are probably 75 to 100 year old fig trees and uh, they know when the figs start to arrive, as do a lot of the birds, the ravens especially. Um, it's always fun photographing them uh, as they're so nimble. Uh, they have semi-retractable claws, and, and they use their tail to counterbalance um, on these really finely limbs to get to the best fruit. So we get a little bit of that six weeks, I'd say. Um, it's good times to see them doing this. Um, this was uh, last year in the corral. Uh, in May, we start, everybody's keeping their eyes open for uh, pups uh, being born near the uh, corral or in the canyon. And uh, these two pups, they're nursing there. And uh, we hadn't seen anything. And then all of a sudden, mom and dad 
ran through the corral and the mom was dragging one up by her teeth. And, uh, and then the next day they went and got the other one. So they weren't born in the corral, but they were raised in the corral. And so we were seeing them every day and I spent, I spent hours with them. Um, it was a lot of fun. That's them there. Just like little miniature grizzly bears, uh, but they're not much bigger than the on my hand. Um, and for, I don't know, two weeks maybe, they're pretty much isolated right there to their den. They're not strong enough to go climbing and, and uh, their mom was, she was, would have enough of nursing. She would move up the side to the left of this shot up on the rocks, knowing they couldn't get up there so she could have a break. But the dad has been amazing. He actually still is around with um, the pups and he still plays with them and they still act like pups every now and then, even though they're just over a year old now. But the mom has since passed. She's not, she's not around anymore. Uh, he still uh, spends a lot of time with them. This is a, uh, a video of them last last year playing. Um, and they kind of beat the snot out of each other. It's all in good fun, though. Um, this is in the gully behind the corral. And it was pretty much like this all the time they were out. Once they weren't napping or nursing, they were uh, going to town on each other. See a glove there that they swiped from the corral from somebody. Um, they had all these little maze of tunnels in the lemonade berry and, and um, the old grapevine. And, and, uh, so it was a lot of a lot of good fun uh, spending time with them. And that's it. Uh, this harbor seal is telling everybody to come paddle with us out there. So if you have the inclination you know where to find us. Thank you everybody for tuning in. I hope uh, you enjoyed that little bit. Um, maybe we'll see you out there. All right, Chuck, great. Thank you. What neat photography. And uh, right off the bat, somebody asked where your cover photo was. And it reminded me some of, of some of the sea caves on Anacapa, but you said that one was on uh, the one with that great light was on Santa Cruz, right? Yeah, yeah, it was on Santa Cruz. And I mentioned there's over a hundred sea caves on Santa Cruz Island alone. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, there's a, there's quite a bit, and on Anacapa. Okay, guys, um, I have a few uh, questions. Uh, saved up and I see some more are coming in, which is cool. Uh, so feel free to ask. We've got uh, at least 15 minutes here. If you got the time, Chuck. And, yeah, I'm uh, good to go. Yeah. Great. So let me ask, um, uh, there's, a, there's some good kayaking questions here. We'll start with those. Uh, Emmanuel wants to know, besides room for gear storage in a touring kayak, any recommendations for a kayak shape and size best for these waters. Also, how is launching from uh, the beach zone? Um, launching, uh, launching from the beach zone, well, it depends where you are. Um, there are some places that are very, very easy, uh, if this question is referring to out of the islands, and then there's other places where it's not so easy. Um, it could be as easy as just lapping on the beach and walking your kayak out there and then taking off. And then I can sit here and say, I've been washed to the beach on one or two attempts on, the, on parts of Santa Rosa. Um, so it can be very difficult as well. I have an old kayak. It's a, it's a kayak made by uh, Necky and, and the model they don't make anymore. It's a dolphin. And I want to say it's somewhere between 12 and 14 feet long. It's very sleek, it's low in the water, it's got great storage though. And um, I've used that for all my paddling trips uh, out of the islands and everywhere else uh, that I've paddled along the coast. Okay, great. And Brian Lopez had two questions. What kind of kayak do you paddle and why do you prefer a sit on top uh, versus kayak versus a uh, uh, sit inside 
type kayak. That's a good question. Um, I've paddled sit on or closed deck boats and um, adventure races in uh, Alaska, uh, Iceland. Um, but I love to sit on uh, sit on top mainly for photography. Um, it offers me a lot more flexibility to move around on the boat. Uh, I can steady the boat. Um, I can throw a leg over each side of the boat and steady the boat that way. And uh, I've had a couple of miscues where I've had the camera out and um, in rough water and started going over the kayak, coming out of the kayak and able to keep the camera above my head and uh, any sacrifice on my body was okay. Um, as long as the camera was good, I'm good. Um, so I like, I like the, and I also like uh, the sit on top because I can get in and out of it quickly. And sometimes you got to move fast um, out of the islands. Okay. Um, have you encountered any white sharks while paddling? Uh, Marla Martin wants to know. Um, surprisingly, uh, nothing around the islands. I have, I had an interesting encounter with one, uh, I want to say the winter of 2009. Uh, out of Ventura Harbor and I was paddling basically just, I call it a commute. Uh, I was going out to guide uh, out of Scorpion and I just left the day before. Instead of taking the boat, I paddled across and came across uh, a great white uh, out by the oil platforms. I had about a three foot tall dorsal fin cruise right in front of the bow of my boat. And so still being about nine miles away and by myself, uh, picked up the pace, uh, but I never saw the shark again. I definitely looked over both shoulders the entire time and kept an eye out for it, but it, it never showed. I kind of under the belief that keep moving um, and at a good pace, it feels like they're gonna leave you alone. I wanna say most of the attacks I've heard on kayakers are fishermen. Um, so it's hard to say, you know, sitting still and maybe there's some bait in the water that lures them in. I think that might be a factor, um, but paddling around all the islands and being in the food chain and seeing all the food that's out there for them, I am surprised that I've never uh, seen, seen at least one. I mean, there's been lots of times where I thought I'm for sure I'm gonna see one. It's spooky looking and deep water, lots of animals around, but I reckon it'll happen sooner or later. Okay, great. Um, then a couple of questions about paddling from Carpinteria to the islands. Um, they wanted to make sure they heard that right, 20 miles from Carpinteria to the islands. And then uh, another one related to that, how long did it take to do that? Um, but that's uh, fun, by the way, that was Steve Gabriel and Jennifer Kirby were asking us. Okay, yeah, that's good questions. Um, well, the islands stagger westward. Um, the shortest distance is uh, Oxnard to Anacapa Islands, about 11 miles, but then it's about 20 miles from uh, the Ventura Harbor to Scorpion Anchorage. And then from Carpinteria, just straight out, I pretty much aimed for uh, Diablo. That's the highest point on Santa Cruz Islands, 2,450 feet. So um, I kept that on my left and uh, it's about 23 miles from Carpinteria. Okay, uh, let's see what we got here. Um, so Terry Gillis, I uh, heard you mention uh, the scrub days eating pine nuts. Is that right? I mean, there's only bishop pine on Santa Cruz Island. So uh, are they um, utilizing those and how? Yes. <laughs> yeah, they are. Yeah, they they uh, pound the heck out of acorns and uh, pine nuts. Um, the force of their beak is actually a lot stronger than one would think. Okay, and uh, let's see. Thank you. That was terrific. Says uh, Lisa 
Diniakos. And uh, when there were a couple of questions about uh, when do you volunteer on San Miguel as a ranger and what's that like? I uh, we'll volunteer, I like the fall, uh, so September, October. Um, so, uh, you know, we usually go for at least a week at a time. Three day trips are pretty tight. It's, uh, especially if you want to do all the hikes, uh, you have to be with a ranger uh, when you go on the hikes. Um, so, to really get all four or five hikes in, maybe a full day on the beach at Kyler on your own, uh, you want to have five days out there minimum. Um, so, having seven to nine days out there. Um, really gives you a good opportunity to get a good feel for the island as a ranger. Um, and we're a little spoiled. We sleep in the ranger station, um, which is nice. Um, but it's also great camping out there. I mean, there's wind breaks out there, but uh, when you're camping, you're definitely um, feeling everything there is about the island, the wind, the moisture, um, what it's really like out there. Uh, you know, I'm uh, <laughs> sorry I didn't hear your answer, Chuck, but we had another question because I'm reading while you're answering, but Sheila Lodge. Hi, Sheila. Great to have you on board. I wanted to know also um, how long it takes you to cross normally. The, okay. From, uh, yeah. Um, the last time I paddled from uh, Carpinteria to um, Santa Cruz, it took me about seven and a half hours, and it usually takes longer to paddle out than it does to come in. Um, I paddled home last March. Um, I got one nice little window, and I took advantage of it. And, uh, got the prisoners and then paddled um, home, and it took about six and a half hours. I had a perfect day. Glassy, really boring. Didn't see any whales or dolphins. Uh, lots of seabirds, though, which was good. A perfect day to paddle home. Uh, speaking of whales, uh, Steve Gabriel wanted to know if you've seen any orcas, any killer whales. Um, not from the kayak. I that would, if I had a bucket list, that would be at the top of it. Um, but we do see them from the boats, the Island Packer boats, and the Condor Express in Santa Barbara comes across them quite a bit. Uh, last December was arguably the best month, maybe. Maybe somebody knows better than me um, for orca sightings. Um, so that December uh, 2021, it was incredible. They were, we saw a mating, we saw an all white orca. Um, There's lots of hunting of marine mammals out there, dolphins, seals, sea lions, uh, lots of uh, orcas active out in the channel last December. Okay. And, um... Michelle Isa, I like this one. What is the craziest thing that ever uh, has happened crossing the channel? Uh, I guess the first time was the dumbest time to do it. Um, I didn't know much. And uh, I had three other lifeguards with me and um, I weren't paying good enough attention to the weather and we left the harbor in Santa Barbara. It, in the morning and then by the time we got to the oil platforms uh, we had pea soup fog and um, I didn't want to quit we probably should have quit so we kept going anyway by compass and uh, kind of like the desert can play tricks on your eyesight um, the fog can do the same thing and uh, we actually got out in the shipping lane we didn't know we were in the shipping lane uh, and we thought we were looking at Anacapa Island. And so we were really concerned that we were drifting um, that far to the southeast. Um, and then when we had an eye on what we thought was Anacapa, we were amazed by how fast we were moving, but we weren't moving really at all. It was uh, the first of seven uh, ships in the shipping lane. And um, so we knew we were in the shipping lane and then we hailed uh, the last ship that we saw on our radios and he told us exactly where we were. And we were about eight miles east from the island. And, and so we felt a lot better then. Um, but there's been a lot of interesting crossings between the islands, uh, big winds, big swell, um, 
a long day paddling from Santa Cruz to Santa Barbara Island once. Um, so it's not always simple out there. Um, I guess if it was, everybody would be doing it. Um, but um, there's just no better way, in my belief, uh, to experience the islands. It's definitely from a kayak. Okay, and then um, you said you had worked for uh, Santa Barbara Adventure Company, correct? Doing guiding out there? Correct. Um, so somebody wanted to know, do you provide uh, kayak guides on the islands? So I think you did with Santa Barbara Adventure Company, but let's see if I fully understand this question. Also, if so, how do I connect with you? This is all from Kurt, by the way. And he also asks, if not, do you mind if I reach out another time to get them get more intel in other words do you uh, do they go to your website what's the best way to get a hold of you dan uh, you can get me you can get me on my website or you can direct message me on instagram but um you know i i see a lot of people that come out on tours of course and then we see a lot of people that bring their own boats or they rent boats on the mainland and then they come out and you know that they, they're not getting the experience that they could uh, it's a good idea to go with a guy the first time. It's just people just don't know what they can access. Uh, they don't know the conditions. They're not wearing helmets. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, if someone wants to go on a guided trip, um, they can contact Santa Barbara Adventure Company. And if they want to go with me, they can request me. Um, that happens a fair bit. Um, but it is really a good idea to go with a guide out there the first time just to get uh, a little bit of a feel for what you're in for so aaron uh, kreisberg our ecologist says do you miss your old manager that's why i was laughing <laughs> what up aaron <laughs> of course i miss you where the hell are you you gotta bring your little boy with you though now yeah, I just had a kid. He started with us uh, just a, um, six months ago or so. That's what I heard. Good for him. I'm happy. Right. Love working with him. So, um, all right. And then Helene Finger. Hello, Helene. Uh, Longtime supporter of CIR. Uh, what kayaking locations on the islands do you recommend? Oh, boy. Um, well, if you go on a tour, you're not going to get cheated. There's lots of great caves and there's great wildlife around. Uh, I mean, I love the harder stuff. I love paddling around San Miguel, and uh, you know, it's just it's just wild. It looks like it did a thousand years ago. I mean, it's it's incredible. Um, and of course, Santa Rosa Island is amazing. Uh, beaches are beautiful. Uh, and then Santa Barbara Island, when it opens up again, that's a great island to experience. It's small, it's only one square mile. You can do everything in a weekend out there. Um, hike, snorkel, paddle. Uh, you can paddle around the island in a couple hours, but it'll take you longer than that because there's a lot of wildlife out there too. Speaking of which, um, somebody wants to know if you camp somewhere else while you're out there but you're you're staying at the campground on the island right on santa barbara island uh and yeah was, you are uh, you are staying there's no beaches out there really i mean it's pretty tight there's no yeah, there's no beaches and any beach there is out there it's occupied by elephant seals and there's thousands of sea lions out there um certain times of the year they uh santa rosa island offers beach camping but that's a uh, you know, that's a big effort to uh, to do that. Um, the wind can out of the northwest can really make it tough on uh, kayakers out there. Um, so you got to be you got to be a strong paddler to get around that island and camp. Great. And then uh, Seth Peterson said, "Did you say your tent broke? Paul's broke on the second night. I heard you say that. But then was it the elephant seals? He asked." Yeah, so after I left those elephant seal pups, those three, um, I continued around South Point, and I knew before the trip started that the weather was going to get really nasty. 
And uh, I paddle around um, South Point, past Cluster Point, around Sandy Point, and thought about going to San Miguel. And I started to go to San Miguel. It was about a quarter mile off the island, and I felt the northwest wind coming, and I knew it was going to howl the next day. It was that's etched in my memory. It was blowing sustained 47 miles an hour and gusting to 60. And uh, so I decided to turn around and I, I went down uh, the coast of Santa, Santa Rosa Island and I camped at uh, Arlington Canyon. And when I was pitching my tent, the pole snapped. So I'm assuming they were stressed out from the extra weight that was uh, squeezing in on me uh, the night before at Hoya Vieja. Great. Okay, um, so there was a question also just about where where this uh, presentation will be available, and uh, it'll be um, it's live on Facebook and uh, YouTube right now. So as soon as we're done, it'll show up there. But the archive of all of our um, webinars that we've done, there's lots of really cool information on there. I urge people to go in there and check them out. Really, really neat stuff is um on uh, maury just put it in the chat so you can check that out it's cirweb.org that's our main website slash webinars so a uh, really great collection of amazing knowledge from some really amazing people like chuck so chuck we had over 100 participants i didn't uh, see exactly what the peak was and uh gee over uh 30 questions uh um asked so yeah, you're you're right up there with all with everybody else. Lots and lots of interest. Awesome. Uh, Thank you. But <laughs> Doris wants you to show you show your muscles if you have a second. <laughs> okay, now the questions okay. are getting a little odd, people. <laughs> well, I got my biceps from my mother, so <laughs> she was an Armstrong. <laughs> okay, so. Yeah. And then a lot of people just said amazing photos and uh, and uh, uh, they really appreciate it. I, I didn't read all those comments, but you know, lots of thanks, uh, Thank lots of appreciation and a lot of compliments for the photos. So thank you so much for joining us, Chuck. Thank that you, thanks great. for having me, I appreciate it. And thank you everybody else for coming along for the ride. And uh, remember we've put our Equinox Cruise information in the um, chat. You're, you're hearing about it early. It's a fundraiser for CIR, but uh, it is a great experience. You're going to really enjoy it. It's uh, reasonably priced, especially when you consider all the great experts are going to go out there and, and take you around the island. My favorite is Steve Junak. Well, I shouldn't say I have a favorite. One of my favorites is Steve Junak, and, uh, that, and that's because he's the guy who got me into conservation and uh, took me seriously when I said, how does somebody work out on the Channel Islands? And uh, really, it changed my life. So that was pretty neat. Um, yeah, thank you too, Susan and everyone else. And uh, uh, Helene, love the presentation. We love you too. Back at you. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maury, for your help. Have a good evening. Thanks again. Good night, everyone. Thank you.